Imagine Las Vegas in the 1950s, a rooftop restaurant of a luxurious casino. Music is playing, guests are sipping cocktails. Then the maitre taps a spoon against the glass and says, Your attention, please. The music stops, a distant explosion is heard, the building trembles, and a small nuclear mushroom cloud rises on the horizon. The guests applause and return to their conversations. The orchestra resumes playing. What's there to be afraid of? Just routine atomic testing. Many people came to Vegas specifically to see this. And the rooftop restaurant was built for the very purpose. 1950s America had a true love affair with the atom and atomic technology. It seems like atomic energy was just about to solve all humanity's problems. But it all started earlier, 1903. That was when Marie Curie defended her doctoral dissertation titled Research on Radioactive Substances at the Sorbonne. Her presentation caused a sensation. The audience was especially captivated by the news of the discovery of two new chemical elements, polonium and radium, which the Curies had managed to extract in their love from uranium residues. The great physicist Rutherford recalled that there was a celebratory dinner afterwards, where Pierre Curie presented a technological marvel to the guests, a flask with a solution of radium that glowed in the dark. Everyone was thrilled. <laughs> Frederick Soddy, Rutherford's colleague in atomic research and popularizer of the subject, wrote that very soon atomic energy would turn deserts into fertile fields, melt the polar ice, and transform the entire Earth into a blooming paradise. Research into radioactivity was met with enthusiasm. People believed that scientists were about to tame the sun itself. The dazzling prospects made even scientists head spin, and society was greeted by a true atomic race. Charlatans quickly emerged, proclaiming radioactivity as a miraculous cure for all elements and peddling corresponding products. For instance, in Czech Republic, healing springs with radioactive water were advertised. In Germany, a radioactive toothpaste called Doramad appeared. Ads claimed that radiation straightened teeth and gums and promised customers that their smiles would literally glow. In America, the Rutherford company successfully sold radioactive supplements. The French cosmetics company Thoradia released an entire line of radioactive products, toothbrushes, soap, and face creams. The packaging boasted a formula by Dr. Curie, because the company had hired a doctor with the same last name, not relation to Pierre and Marie Curie, just a namesake. The technological progress of the first half of the 20th century coincided with the rise of the first true mass culture. The print runs of comic books and pulp science fiction magazines reached into the millions. The 1930s, the 1940s, and the 1950s are considered the so-called golden age of comics and science fiction, much of which was heavily inspired by atomic films. New heroes emerged, such as Flash, a student who inhaled vapors from heavy water and became the fastest man alive. Interestingly, his peer and rival, Atom, initially had no superpowers. However, he was later reimagined and in the new version he gained the ability to shrink his body into subatomic level. The technological optimism of the mid-20th century remained unshaken by two world wars and the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Society views science as a kind of magic. If a mightly genie could destroy two entire cities, then surely it could also build a palace. Both teenagers and adults devoured science fiction books and magazines, which promised incredible things. In the very near future, everything would be atomic, from spaceships to calculators. Concepts of home of the futures were published, where everything ran on atomic energy. The television, toaster, refrigerator, and air conditioner. And all of it was environmentally friendly. Sketches appear of atomic trains and atomic airplanes. The automotive industry was particularly enthusiastic. They seriously predicted that very soon cars would run on nuclear batteries, each lasting several years. 
putting gas stations out of business. Surprisingly, these weren't just wild dreams of a handful of enthusiasts. The public viewed atomic cars as part of the near future. City planners even seriously discussed widening American highways. Their reactor-equipped concept cars were large and heavy, and to prevent accidents, expanding the roads seemed like a practical solution. Alice, these grand plans collided with the laws of physics. The Ford Nuclear turned out to be truly gigantic, with an estimated weight of at least 10 tons. Yet, even for such a big vehicles, no one could develop a reactor small enough to fit. Aviation showed slightly more promise. It was a matter of strategic importance and the military was in charge. Fitting a reactor into an aircraft proved easier than into a car. In Soviet Union, work was underway on a nuclear-powered loitering bomber, which, in theory, could fly almost indefinitely, needing to land only to replace its exhausting crew. While that vision was never fully realized, 34 test flights were conducted with a reactor on board. The Americans had a similar program, but it also stopped short. Their version involved a conventional bomber flying with a reactor on board to test whether the crew would survive radiation exposure. The conclusion? They wouldn't. Both the USSR and the US ultimately realized that a flying nuclear reactor wasn't a great idea. What if it crashed? A similar issue arose with a nuclear-powered trains. Engineers concluded that they could indeed build such trains. But what would happen if one derailed due to an accident or terrorist attack? The idea of peaceful nuclear explosions for digging tunnels, creating canals, and building underground reservoirs never gained traction. After initial experiments, it became clear that the cost of relocating local residents and decontaminating the soil far outweighed any benefits. The only real success story was in the Navy. Nuclear-powered submarines and surface warships went into mass production and have since become commonplace. For fans of technological progress, practical limitations were of little interest. Why worry about weight constraints when we'd be flying to Mars tomorrow? Atomic mania firmly took root in 1950s and 1960s culture and blended with the growing fascinations with space. No atomic cars? <laughs> no problem. Regular cars were designed to look like rockets, with streamlined contours, exhaust-like details, fins, and plenty of chrome. There were no space cities either, but space-inspired interiors became all the rage. Sleek, white spaces with smooth corners. Trendy furniture looked as though it had been taken straight off a flying saucer. Paco Rabanne and Pierre Cardin released collections inspired by science fiction. Atomic theme decor was everywhere, lumps shaped like atoms and fabrics featuring atomic prints. Architects also made their mark <laughs> for a time. The trendiest style was the oddly named Googie, also known as Popolux or Duop. A perfect example is one of the buildings at Los Angeles International Airport, built during that era, which resembles either a flying saucer or a giant model of an atom. Like any responsible parents throughout history, American moms and dads wanted to prepare their children for the future. And the future, as they saw it, was atomic. In an effort to educate their kids, many bought them radioactive toys, arguably the most astonishing example of atomic mania. In the 1950s, American toy stores sold actually junior physicist nuclear kits containing real isotopes. The most famous was Gilbert Atomic Energy Lab, launched in 1951 by magician and inventor Alfred Gilbert. This isn't a joke or marketing exaggeration. The kit genuinely included radioactive elements and everything needed to experiment with them at home. The mini laboratory featured a spin telescope, allowing children to observe radioactive decay on a fluorescent screen. It also came with a giga counter, a manual, a screen coated with radium, and a physics book. The radioactive elements were stored in four glass vials, not pure isotopes, but uranium or samples. The manual explained how the tools worked and included descriptions of experiments. For example, 
a family member could hide a gamma radiation source somewhere in the house, and the young physicist would use the Geiger counter to locate it. The included physics book featured a reassuring preface. We hasten to assure you and your parents that the radioactive sources provided are in no way dangerous. Leading scientists of the country have worked to make them completely harmless and highly educational. We guarantee that daily contact with the radioactive material supplied in your atomic energy laboratory will not harm you. Unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately, the toy never gained much popularity. Over two years, only 5,000 units of the lab were sold, leading to the company to discontinue it. One reason might have been its high price, $50 at the time, which is roughly equivalent to five, $560 today. Everything about the kit was entirely legal. At that time, the sale and distribution of radioactive materials were completely unregulated. By the late 1960s, atomic mania had faded. The public realized that Earth wouldn't be transformed into a paradise and journeys to other stars abroad, atomic rockets were also postponed. In the 1970s, admiration for atomic energy was replaced by fear of nuclear war. Eventually, that fear too passed, and the atom began to be seen simply as a part of everyday life. For modern audiences, however, it primarily lives on through cinema. One can recall not only Kubrick's iconic Doctor Strangelove, but also the recent TV series based on the Fallout video game. In Fallout, the protagonists fight mutants and cannibals amid the ruins of a future America a future envisioned by 1950s sci-fi writers and futurists, drenched in doo-wop style. Interestingly, the creators of Fallout had a very specific source of inspiration. During the era of atomic mania, they were children and their work became, above all, a parody of the mass culture of their youth. Who knows, maybe one of them even had a radioactive junior atom scientist kit as a child. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, it helps my channel more than you know. Thank you very much for watching, I'm Natasha and see you tomorrow!